OK, so we're going to start looking at our earthquake case studies for our natural hazards unit. And we're going to start off looking at the Christchurch earthquake okay, that occurred back in February of 2011. The earthquake measured 6.3 on the Richter scale. Now, when we look at our earthquakes, we actually look at two different earthquakes. We first off look at, as, we, as we're doing here, the Christchurch one, which is an example of an earthquake in a uh, high-income country or richer part of the world. And then we're also going to look at a case study of an earthquake in a poorer part of the world, which is Nepal. Uh, for both of those, we need to look at the effects and responses to the earthquake. So we're going to start off with the effects on this side and then the responses over on this side. What we can also do is we can start categorising those down into short-term or long-term or primary and secondary responses and uh, impacts. So we've got our primary impacts and our secondary impacts, or otherwise known as short-term and long-term. So let's start off with the primary impacts then. Okay, so first off, obviously any natural hazard, probably the, the most natural uh, response or sorry, impact to talk about is a uh, number of deaths. So in the Christchurch earthquake, we're looking at 180 uh, fatalities. Okay. These were predominantly, predominantly caused by collapsing buildings, of which there was over 10,000 in Christchurch. Uh, in terms of an economic impact, uh, Lancaster Park, which is Christchurch major rugby stadium, was severely damaged. So if we draw that here. Thing. And if we really just stress there, we can put like a L and a P there to remind ourselves that it's Lancaster Park, that little bit of extra information. Okay. Now that takes us in really nicely into our secondary uh, effects or impacts. What we saw was a significant loss of income due to the fact that Christchurch was not able to uh, hold any World Cup rugby matches due to the damage to the stadium. That resulted in a significant loss of tourist income for Christchurch as a city. That can then also be linked into our next secondary impact, which saw uh, the Christchurch population decrease by 10,000 people between 2010 and 2013. Much of this decrease was put down to people leaving the city due to fear of another potential earthquake, either the severe damage to their properties or the loss of income due to uh, the destruction of maybe their, their businesses. Now, as I said, there was two options really with the, the earthquake case studies in this unit. Either you can be asked to compare the two and look at the difference in the impacts or responses between a rich and a poor uh, examples of an earthquake. And you, know, it's, you should be looking at reasons for why the death toll would have been much lower in Christchurch than it will be in our next case study of Nepal, you know, due to better healthcare, better quality of uh, buildings, a quicker response and so on. Or one of the things that the exam seems to be looking at is the idea of getting you to assess whether or not secondary impacts or effects are worse than primary impacts or vice versa. Now there's no wrong or right answer here. It's up to you, it's just looking for you to make a decision. So for example, you might decide that the secondary impacts are worse, that the loss of income okay, as a long-term impact is going to, uh, as therefore resulting in this 10,000 uh, people leaving the city due to maybe uh, uh, basically unable to survive there anymore due to uh, sort of falling incomes. You might then argue the other way and said that's perfectly acceptable. You might say actually no primary effects are significantly worse. 180 deaths is a much more significant impact than, for example, the inability to hold rugby games and any loss of income. That is up to you, but it's worthwhile considering which one you think is worse so that if a question like that came up in the exam, you'd be able to argue either way. So we're going to move on to looking at responses. Uh, in terms of the responses, the first short-term response that I would always consider talking about is the international aid. And this is uh, particularly useful if you're asked to compare the responses between an earthquake in a high-income and low-income part of the world. Christchurch, obviously in New Zealand, therefore uh, is uh, considered a high-income country, somewhere around the 25th highest GDP in the world. Uh, received minimal international aid, only around seven million pound, uh, seven million dollars. Most of that coming from the Australian government. New Zealand was able to support itself through its response due to being that high-income country. Whereas, as we will see when we look at Nepal, as a low-income country, it required a much larger contribution from international aid. 
One of the things that New Zealand put its wealth towards doing was repositioning its satellites directly above Christchurch. This meant that they could identify areas that were particularly uh, damaged or in particular need of help from emergency services so that emergency services would access the areas most in need of the help quickly and therefore help save lives. This may contribute to the reduced number of deaths that we see. One of the other things that uh, happened was that the Red Cross, okay, an international charity, even though New Zealand's a rich country, they will still go and uh, provide their assistance. They provide temporary shelter for 200 people. Seems like a lot, but as we'll see when we compare it to the Nepal earthquake, actually that's quite a low number, suggesting that most people's accommodation or housing actually remained intact after the earthquake due to the better buildings and uh, construction due to New Zealand being a high income country. If we move on to the long term responses, again, we can see how New Zealand as a rich country was able to quickly and effectively respond to the Christchurch earthquake. For example, despite electricity supplies being knocked out, they were up and running again within one week. This was also similar kind of time period of things such as uh, water that also water pipes that had also been damaged were quickly repaired so that people had access to basic facilities. One of the other things that they did was they used their wealth to create a program called GeoNet. Now, GeoNet is basically an earthquake prediction system. Uh, generally, earthquakes are very difficult to predict and uh, any attempts to do so have been, uh, had limited success. However, actually GeoNet is probably one of the uh, most uh, potentially successful earthquake prediction systems on the market at the moment. And it's been developed through the money uh, provided by the New Zealand government. And obviously, the idea being, if they can predict an earthquake, they can therefore evacuate areas and reduce the potential uh, risk to life and properties. One of the other things they did was, after the earthquake had finished, they evaluated where the damage had been worse. And they basically split Christchurch up into four categories, ranking them from safe to rebuild and then up to exclusionary. So area one would have been an area that was safe to rebuild and uh, kind of repair, whereas area four, they decided was an area that uh, should be uh, an exclusion area and no building should occur in that area because in case of another earthquake, the damage would have been severe. Again, you may be asked to consider the importance of responses. So you might be asked to uh, say, are short-term or primary responses more important than secondary responses? Again, the argument is up to you. It's about considering which one do you think uh, is more important and then being able to successfully justify your decision.